Guten Morgen. Es tut mir leid, dass mein Deutsch ist ganz peinlich. Ich habe etwas Deutsch gelernt, aber in den letzten 20 Jahren ich habe ich fast keine Übung gehabt. Und es ist besser, wenn wir machen alles aus Englisch machen. You have my text, I think. It is more or less what I will be saying. I will try to speak slowly, but this is not always easy. I have to begin by saying the first word I learned in the German language was almost 44 years ago in Sligo when I was studying German with a German professor called Bodecker. And he said, in the first class, he said, Herr Tai, du bist ein Plappermaul. <laughs> so, sometimes for Plappermauls, it is not easy to talk slowly. <laughs> um, he was correct in his, um, I like to talk and sometimes I talk too much, so I beg your independence and understanding. I will try to keep to time today. Um, the first thing I would like to do is to thank you very much for this invitation. It is really great for us at Rome, at the Pontifical Council, to have the opportunity to meet people who are working in the field of communications. You're the ones doing the real work. Our job is, according to our constitution, to support you, to encourage you, to challenge you, to invite you to ever better efforts. But if you are not doing the work, there's nothing we could do. And what you are doing in gathering like this is exactly the model I think we need if, as a church, we're going to engage effectively with social media. We need to share our expertise. We need to talk together. So I'm delighted to be here. I'm here to speak with you, but more importantly, to learn and to listen. And the speech I will give today is essentially what I have picked up listening to people like you in different parts of the world. This is not our reflection. I would like to begin just the first slide is a simple enough one. It's one that is sometimes more important speaking with a non-church audience than with a church audience. But I want to make three simple points. The first one, communications. I have no theoretical background in communications. I studied law, I studied theology. But when I came to communications, I began with the idea communications is for transporting for sharing, for exchanging information. I have learned to recognize that communication is equally important to establish relationships, and that the exchange of information will often happen in the context of a relationship, and that the relationship is built up by the exchange of relationship. And I think this is important for us. We keep communication is about information, news, but it's also about relationships, building good relationships. For the church, communications is, I think, a core essential activity. We exist as a church because we were founded by Christ and told to bring good news to the world. If the church is not communicating, then it is not being faithful to its mission to Christ, which is a mission of bringing good news to the world. Communication is also vitally important for our internal existence. Every parish, every community flourishes if there is good communication, if there is bad communication, then more and more problems emerge. So communication is actually not just an external activity, but is at the heart of who we are as a community. And then the other point I want to say is, when we think about communications, we think very often about media, television, radio, but everything we do in the church communicates. People outside are seeing us, seeing our churches, seeing our hospitals, seeing our schools, seeing us as individuals, and are judging the church. So we need to be attentive to how people understand us. How are we communicating with our body, with our, not just formally, but informally? So we need to keep this attention on communication because it's defines who we are for much of the world. The final point I want to make on this first slide is not so important here, but sometimes when we're talking, we talk about the church, people think uniquely about Rome. Rome is important. It's a center of unity for the Catholic Church. It's also a very powerful communications tool. As I say, the whole world stops to see smoke coming out of a chimney in the Vatican 
we do great communications with symbols and simplicity, and this is part of the magic. But Rome is not everything. For most of us, our experience of church and faith begins with a local community, with a Catholic school, with some person who introduces us to social activity. So what we need to do in our communications is build a communications that has the Roman and the central elements, but that also relates to what happens at the local community. And two values that I think are important there, subsidiarity, we should do at the local level what is best done at the local level. And the second one is communio. The church will be different in different places. That is a richness. We should not try a uniformity, but to understand and to value the diversity and the plurality that is part of the reality of the church. That's my first slide. The second slide is simply want to think about this digital world. It's easy for me today, yesterday we had an excellent presentation that explained to us the changes that are happening in the digital, how the changes are exponential. Moore's law, this everything is becoming faster, cheaper, more connected, more accessible. And this is important. But I think the real change, the real revolution or transformation is in the culture. I was at home before coming here I had lunch on Sunday with my, two of my nephews and one niece. They are aged between, one is 20 and the oldest is 25. But they are learning in a very different way to me. They get their news in a totally different way. They express themselves in a different way. They form community and relationship in a totally different way. So the real revolution is not in the technology but it's in how they are living. When, they are left, when I left school, secondary school, I perhaps never saw many of the people again. They are connected all the time. And this is a change in how we relate. So this is, we need to understand the real interesting change is not primarily the technology, but is in the culture. Related to that, I would want to say for the church, we need to understand that that culture is continuing to change. We cannot know what the future will bring. Nobody can tell us. Because what the communications revolution has done, it has given power to the consumers and to the users. So they decide Facebook is good. Younger people decide we prefer Snapchat. Younger people, again, are moving to different platforms. So we need to see the communications revolution is ongoing. Also, it is changing us. As a community, we're all about identity, about relationships, and how we form community. And this is being changed by social media. One of the most interesting things we have every week, year for a week in Santa Clara in California, we gather theologians and communications experts, and in a very relaxed way, California is good for that, we, in a very relaxed way, we discuss and understand where the changes are happening. Not the technical changes, but the cultural changes and what the challenges are for us. A number of insights that for us in our office we try and say all the time. First one we have to say, especially to bishops from different parts of the world, not just bishops, but people of an older generation, the digital is real. Very often you get language and it says, the digital world the virtual world, and then there is the real world. The digital is real. If you get an electronic bank transfer, that is real. If I am walking down the street and I see an airplane flying over, and I take my iPad and I point at it and it tells me what the airplane is, then the digital is helping me to understand the material. So that the material and the digital are constantly in communication, they interpenetrate. So we need to avoid the dualism, the virtual and the real. In the instrument, Instrumentum Laboris for this year's synod, the document produced before the synod, they had this terrible thing about families, real communication is dying because the children are in a virtual world. It's not that simple. The virtual is real. Our younger people, and not just our younger people, live in an integrated reality. 
where the digital enhances what they are doing. So before I meet somebody in my office, I Google them. I know a certain amount about them before I meet them. So when I meet them, it is, a, it is an enhanced augmented reality. Somebody could discover my love for punk music by looking at Google this morning. <laughs> so this is a different way of negotiating our culture. But what is clear is this digital is where younger people in particular are expending and passing more and more of their time. And if we are absent, if we are not present in that digital world as a church, then we are going to be absent from an important part of their lives. The next question though is, how can we be present in an effective manner? We cannot just simply say, we have to be on Facebook, we have to be on YouTube, we have to, and then we just put anything there. No, we need to be effective in our presence because the digital is different. We have a rule, we never say new media, because if you say new media, you, exp you are saying I'm over 50. <laughs> new, media, new, media is, new media is normal media. My nephews and nieces do not talk about new media. They talk about the people of 13 and 14 who are living in a new world. <laughs> but, but new media, the world created by new media is different. There are different dynamics. There are different ways of communicating. And one image we have used is to think about it as a continent. And in the past, before we could evangelize or bring the gospel to a continent, we need to know the language and the customs. We also need to know the language and the customs of the digital world if we are to be present effectively. The final point on this one I want to make is simply that one question we're often getting is, how will we use new media to evangelize? <clears throat> Wrong. How will we be present in the world that is brought about by digital media so that we are effectively present? It's no longer an instrumental use because media are no longer instruments, they're creating the environment in which we live. So the next thing I would like to focus on, I better, oops. Uh, 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 yeah, is presence. And this, I think, is a key one, is how can we as individual believers and how can we as church be present in a digital world? First thing is to say we should reconcile. We are there both as citizens, as every human person has a right to be there as a citizen, but we are there as believers. If we are good citizens, then we will be credible in our faith. If we are good believers, then it obliges us to be good citizens. So the traditional elements remain for our presence. Our first effort, I think, is we must contribute with others to humanize the digital world. In many parts of the world, when you read about digital, you read about bullying, harassment, trolls, negativity. Part of our effort has to be to change that culture. Very often we talk about a user-generated content in social media, the user-generated, but the culture of social media is itself a human construct. It's our participation. If we are negative, social media becomes negative. If we can work with others to make it more positive, then it becomes a more human environment where people can be present. I think one thing we have to help working with others is to create an ethic for social media. Not an imposed ethic, but if, if social media is to be social, if it is to help our world to become closer, to help people to grow in knowledge of each other, to grow in understanding of each other, then some fundamental values are important. There has to be respect, honesty, objectivity, the importance of reason, openness, listening. If, if those values are not present, and if we do not bring those values to social media, then they cannot transform and change the world in the way that I think they can. So when Pope Benedict talked about social media and the digital world as a gift for humanity, he also said it will only be positive if individuals and if institutions work to keep them positive. One term he used I just mentioned that he talked about the need to create a culture of respect, dialogue, and friendship. Pope Francis has talked about the culture of encounter, where we value other people. They are not just 
somebody to sell something to. They are not just a market. They are not just useful. They are to be valued as people in themselves. Pope Benedict also used an expression I like very much where he said, it's up to us to give the internet a soul. We need to be careful here. He did not say we are the soul, that we are the only people who are interested in deeper conversation and in truth and in growing as human beings. But as, as believers, we need to allow that dimension of the internet of digital culture to flourish. How do we do that? His instinct was we do that by taking seriously the people we meet, listening to their questions, giving time to their questions, not trying to sell them an answer, not trying to manipulate them immediately, but by listening and engaging and understanding. Again, Pope uh, Benedict has used it, or Francis has used the idea of neighborliness, proximity, how we are people of tenderness and compassion, also in our dealings in internet. And this will change the culture of the blog sites, of the chat rooms, of the comments, that we try and remember it is important for us to be witnesses of humanity. In that context, if our conversations become deeper, if they become more real or more personal, then it may be appropriate to talk about our faith. Because if I am authentically sharing with another person, and they are looking to understand a reason for hope, a reason for purpose, a reason for love in life, then I should share my faith, but not by imposing, but by authentically explaining the deeper roots of my own happiness, the deeper roots. So if I have a sense of faith as a gift, as something that enhances my life, then I wish to share that with others spontaneously. But not imperialism, not as Pope Benedict said, bombarding people with religion, but by, in the openness of the dialogue, not hiding the reality of the faith that is for me a gift, a blessing in my own life. So therefore we're back to that original way of communicating witness. How do I witness? If I am on the media, social media, and I am nasty, and I am cranky, and I am using bad language, and I am always short-tempered, then I cannot be an authentic witness to the peace of faith, to the goodness of religion, to the benefits of having the gifts of God's love. So one thing we say is there's a time to speak, and then there's a time to let love do the speaking. The language issue is one we have, and I will take this quickly because I think it will be obvious to you. The first thing I say is older media, the media we grew up with, I'm used to a microphone. I speak, you listen, or you pretend to listen, or you fall asleep. <laughs> but, but the essential model is I am active and you are passive. And that's what we learned in our churches. When we go to Catholic radio, now we can reach out to more and more people. Television, now they can see me as well as listen to me. But the model is I'm here and you are passive. Social media changes that. I can easily broadcast on social media, but if I want an audience, if I want engagement, if I want participation, then I have to be willing to take questions, then I have to be willing to respond to criticism, then I have to be happy to engage comment. If I don't take other people seriously, they will not take me seriously. And this is a challenge, I think, for us in the church, where we are used to a different model, not just for the church. I think it's all institutions have this challenge. But it's a particular challenge for us to learn because it means there are challenges about what we are doing there. Yeah, sorry, I, okay, I see where I'm going wrong. Sorry about that. So, Part of this then, again, the idea of Pope Francis speaking to our council said to us, social media, your primary thing is listen, conversation, and encouragement. So it's, it's, it's a different way of engaging. Institutionally, that is a challenge. You are the people who are working in media. Social media, some people think, is cheaper. It's not, because it requires a more intense human engagement an answering of questions, a willingness to listen and to debate and to discuss. But I think there are principles for that. One is, we have to do that. The weakness say we have the Pope on Twitter. The Pope tweets, it's one directional. People share it, so that is good, that is a reaction. But he cannot necessarily engage with all the comments and with all the reactions 
And having read most of them, I can assure you some of the language is quite challenging. But there is nothing to stop those of us in different parts of the world recognizing questions in our own languages, recognizing questions that are coming from our own culture, engaging so that we get an interactivity that is at the appropriate level. Not every reaction has to be the Pope. That we lose the sense of the richness of the church. The church is Rome, it is the Pope, and maybe sometimes we should think about the Pope directly responding to a question, but the interactivity should be the church in its richness responding. The second thing on language we talk is the means or the, the forms of language. Again, we are used to the text. Bishops are expected to write letters. Bishops' conferences produce papers. Popes produce encyclicals. But we are living in a world where a lot of our, and they are important, we should never give up on them, but our entry level language has to be a different language. People are used to a language that is more visual, that is more, less textual, that is more immediate and more, um, more visual. And we have to rediscover that. We have it in our tradition and we can discover it again so that we are engaging hearts, not just heads. The other thing I think that is related to that would be the question of vocabulary. Many of the words that we use in our church are words that are not necessarily making sense to younger people, not just younger people today. So we need a, what Pope Francis called a grammar of simplicity. As a theologian, I remember sometimes if somebody asked you a question, you could hide behind theology rather than answer the question. We have to be willing to risk the simple language and if we cannot express it in simple language, maybe it's because we haven't understood it and we hide behind theology. So we need this ability to do that. Uh, very quickly, I'm running out of time. I think one rule is, if in doubt, use the language of Christ. Use the parables, use the stories, use the simplicity. They are still perfect models for social communication in a digital or social network. Pope Francis, I think part of the success of Pope Francis is he is a visual communicator. His gestures are authentic, people relate. The invitation for us is to help them to go behind that and to discover the deeper truths that he wishes because he wants to bring attention not to himself but to the person of Christ. And then as a moral theologian, I used to always say, never have your discussion simply about norms. Get it to deeper questions. Never be caught saying no say a deeper yes to life. And that, that's just my own little warning for myself. Okay, the convergence. This is, the first side of convergence is the institutional challenge. Many of you are people who have grown up with print, who have spent your life in television. Others of you have spent your time in radio. You are now being asked to think in a digital and to work in a digital environment. You're being asked to produce multimedia content. We know, and you know, radio cannot simply be put on the internet and that's it. Print, you just put it on the internet and that's digital. Our images, we put them, we now need to have an integrated way of producing content that is from the beginning multimedia. And that is an institutional challenge. It's not, I think, the core skills, if you are a good writer, if you are a good photographer or filmmaker, if you are good with voice, there is a need for you on digital platforms, but your skills will have to be mixed with other people's. So we have to, and this is institutionally a challenge for us, but it's also personally a challenge. I meet many people who, I am the wrong end of 55. I meet many people my age and they kind of say, but I leave it to the next generation to make the changes. You know, we'll, I will go to retirement and then if we do that, we miss it. We are going to miss a generation. We need to have the courage to change, and that is also a personal challenge. And I wish you good luck with that. But what we need to do this is together. And we learn by, we try different things in different parts of the world. Great thing with social media, you get metrics. You get measurements. You know if anybody has engaged, if anyone has commented. You can adjust those or you can manipulate those. But if we are honest, we can also get good feedback. We need to learn together. What is working? Why is it working? What hasn't worked? 
Can we help other people to avoid the same mistakes? And as a church, we are a network. You are constantly in relationship and communication with people in different parts of the world, in, different, in your own world here in Germany. What we need above all is true meetings like this to create a forum where we share this works, this did not work. Avoid this, try the other, and we need to be honest with each other so that we build our strengths as a church, as a network where we learn together. Our council is very small, but we try to become a hub. We see what's happening and we put people in touch with each other. And I think we have to develop this as our way of learning as a church because we cannot claim authority any longer. The church is another voice in social media. It's a kind of an old voice. Unless we learn to speak correctly and appropriately, we will be absent. A couple of little points. We say travel light. Be willing. The social media platforms are changing, will continue to change. Do not develop a strategy that is tied to one social media platform. Twitter is big, Twitter may go. Apps are important. In 10 years' time, we don't know if we will need apps. We need to have the flexibility to move. The Economist magazine said, be promiscuous. <laughs> try, try everything, but do not marry anything, okay? No lifelong commitments in this limited context. Um, <laughs> We have to be willing to take risks. We live in an organization, I work in Rome, risk adverse. You make mistakes and you will never be forgiven, it seems. But we can never learn a language unless we're willing to make mistakes. And there's my little bit of the Gaelic language, the Irish language there, Mullanogyogus Chokishid, which simply means praise young people, trust young people, and they will rise to the task. We have to, as a church, allow a younger generation be the navigators, be the people who bring us into this new continent because it's not our world. And we need to trust them and we need to help them and dialogue with them, but we need to, we need to learn it is time to let another generation lead us on our way. Um, the other thing is every week in Rome somebody comes who is selling me the definitive answer to all the church's problems. There are no master plans and there are no gurus. Because if we are honest, nobody knows what the future will be. Because it's not the experts will decide, it's not the companies will decide. Five years ago, I went to visit Nokia, which was the leading edge of communications. You know, it was a great visit and I learned a lot. They didn't maybe learn as much, so Nokia is now. <laughs> I'm not saying I had anything to say. Two final, um, okay, um, just, this is the related to the, converg to the um, convergence, which is in one sense the institutional challenge. There is related a personal challenge. Christian discipleship is always about conversion. We are never as good as the message we proclaim. We are always in need of change. And that is also in our, one thing about social media is people want information from people they trust. So even if they ask faith questions, they are asking you to say, who do you say the Lord is? They want your answer, not the catechism, not a quote an expert, they want your answer. This is challenging because it means they want you, but who do you say, what are you thinking? And that is a challenge because it means the faith we want to share has to be authentically our own. And that is a faith we need to cultivate by listening to God's word, and even online, by keeping alive online, the importance of silence and the importance of solitude, so that we have time for the Lord, so that we know the Lord, so that we have a spontaneous affinity with the words of the Lord, so that our communication comes from the heart, is authentically something that testifies to our belief in a person. Because at the core of our message, is not a message, it's not a formula, it's not a, a way of life, it's primarily a relationship to a person. And unless that relationship is authentically present for ourselves, it will be difficult to share it with others. The other thing I think is, when Jesus said, turn the other cheek, he could not have imagined social media. If you engage in social media, you must be ready for the negativity. And resist the temptation, I love, I am renowned as having a sharp tongue. 
And I love having a sharp answer, but I have learned in social media, drop it. It's not going to make you look a nicer, warmer, kinder person. It's going to look you a nasty. Some people like that. But um, we have to be careful that we change the culture. One other point is trust as people who are working in Catholic media. Last night you had a prize, which is important. We celebrate excellence. We celebrate achievement. We need to be as professional as possible. Make the best films. Take the best photographs. Use the best words express ourselves the best way, but recognize that ultimately, if something happens in the heart of another person, it's probably, yeah, we've done the work, but it's God's effectiveness. So we can be peaceful, not complacent, but trusting that God's word continues to resonate in people's hearts. Therefore, one other one is sometimes you go on YouTube and you see a very good Catholic video, and it has had 2,220 views and then you see you know the latest cat video with 120 million or i look at twitter and i see the pope has 16 million um followers on twitter and then i discover sorry, uh, sorry. the pope has yeah 16 million followers on twitter and then i discover there is somebody called um harry styles niall horn who i've never heard of who have over 20 million they are members of one direction a uh, uh, youth uh, group, okay? So you sometimes feel, what are we doing? But remember, it's the yeast that converts the biblical image. It's the small mustard seed. It's the beginning. And to be trusting about that. Finally, and this is finally, finally, I'm, I'm literally going to go four minutes over time. That, that's all. Um, when I look at, if you look at social media, what is driving social media? The key human activities that are driving social media and that the commercial companies know how to exploit, but that are genuine, innate human desires. One is a desire for connectivity. That is driving the Facebook phenomenon and other ones. There's a desire for search. I want to know things. I want to discover things. There's a desire for play, to be challenged, my imagination. There is also a huge desire to share, to give to others. The amount of people who develop um, platforms, technical platforms that they share, that they don't seek to commercial benefits on them, so commons and sharing, people sharing photographs, images. There is something about sharing that is driving social media. And finally, the whole Twitter thing, I want to follow, I want guidance, I want to know who, who I will follow. These are, I think, point to us that the human heart has not changed. The human heart we need to engage because if we take connectivity, most of us know in our lives to have had the experience of one or two good friends is an extraordinary blessing in our life. 247 friends in Facebook is not the same thing. It's the same instinct. People are looking for connectivity. We have to help them to find connectivity of a type that will be life enhancing, that will be positive for them. Um, Okay, on search, even if something is looking for as trivial as where should I eat in Bonn, I want information that is reliable. So how can we have the search that is happening as also being people looking for reliability, for objectivity, for truth perhaps at some level? The gaming institutes, how do we engage beauty? The sharing, some of the sharing we have in social media is narcissistic photographs of myself, me boasting, celebrity. But there is also the truth, as we know, that there is a sharing that is more satisfying, which is the giving to another person, because human heart has not changed. Also then, the following, sometimes on social media, I follow all the people I agree with. I follow all the people who will tell me I am always correct. We need to break that polarization and also get, yeah, maybe somebody I don't agree with can help me to understand things better. So I think as part of us Christians or as believers, we have to build on the positive dimensions of that culture, but engage critically. I think dominate, and we're back, the old false gods, wealth, power, fame, that we have to help people to free them from those, not speaking in love, not being condemnatory. The other thing is I think the, 
the connectivity, that desire for connectivity is where Augustine began. Only with God will my soul be at rest. We have to find a way of that yearning that people have for relationship, of inviting them to a relationship that is trustworthy, that it, where they will be vindicated, where they will be valued. This is Pope Francis, the counter of culture, the God who loves us as we are, no conditions, no obligations, no having to change first, and unconditional love. That, I think, will still touch hearts. People want to hear that deep down. We also need to recognize the nostalgia or the yearning in many people. It's not going to be who is God or where is God. Um, John Green, the guy who wrote that book on the destiny and our stars, is very clear. He says, young people, don't, they're not interested, is there a God or is there not a God? They want to know, how can I love? Who can I trust? Where can I have hope? And these are the questions we have to help people to find. And then finally, I think, we have to respect the mystery of the other person. Never manipulate, no short circuits, no trying to tricks. We respect their authenticity. We offer them the possibility of the encounter of God, but we respect the mystery that is the encounter of every single person with God. Okay, thank you.